morning. Uh, grab your Bibles with me and turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, we're going to go verses 21 to 43, so we'll close out the chapter together this morning. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that we'll be doing another um, live Q&A. It'll be Thursday at 6, and so I want you to be aware of that if you want to get questions in. We learned a valuable lesson last week, and it's that getting the questions in ahead of time is a little bit more helpful because then as I was going through last week answering questions, I checked my phone again and saw a couple of a couple more that had <clears throat> come in and we didn't have time to get to them. So we'll get to those first this week. But I uh, just wanted to remind you of that. And if you have questions, um, feel free to send them in. And um, normally what I do is I kind of look at the questions ahead of uh, ahead of time as far as how many I have and then just kind of go, OK, I can take X amount of time with each question. And so um, it's, it is best uh, to get those in ahead of time if you're able to. All right. Mark chapter 5. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful uh, for your word and for the fact that, that Father, w- without it, we would be left wandering about in the dark, wondering wondering about who you are and wondering about what you have done. And, and yet, instead of leaving us alone in that, you have revealed yourself to us through your word and you have in spectacular ways shown us your son and and God for our joy reminded us of of who he is and what he has done in order to secure our salvation Father I pray that hope would rise in us this morning that worship would rise in us this morning as we look once again at at the words and and the work of this God man Jesus who came into the world to rescue us Father I pray that as we reflect on these things that you would draw many God, actually draw all of us to yourself. God, that we would find ourselves falling at your feet and worshiping you. God, do that work for your glory. In your name we pray it. Amen. Mark chapter 5, verse 21, and here we go. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side... A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. So now you have to remember where we've been. Uh, Last week, we, we saw that Jesus crosses the sea, and he gets out of the boat, and immediately, who shows up? This this demon-possessed man named Legion who shows up and, and Jesus handles that situation. What was Jesus doing before that? that this was back in chapter 4. He was crossing the sea again and the storm kicks up. And Jesus calms the storm and the disciples are afraid. And then the, the boat beaches on the shore and the demon-possessed man comes. Jesus casts out the demons um, the, 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 the people in the town nearby say, Jesus, you got to get out of here. And so Jesus leaves and now he sails back across the sea and he, the boat beaches again. So now they're on the other side and a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name and seeing him, he fell at his feet. Now, Jairus, um, most commentators are, are, are in pretty, pretty close agreement that Jairus is probably going to be the president, the presider uh, over the local synagogue. So this man was, was prominent. He was powerful. He was wealthy. And, and you see here that Jairus kind of sets aside his, um, because you remember this from the Gospel of Mark so far, that Jesus and the religious establishment aren't exactly getting along, and that's putting it lightly. And and so, 
um, Jairus sets aside any and all of that and, and out of a great need that he has. Um, J- Jairus isn't running and throwing himself at Jesus' feet because he loves Jesus. He's running and throwing himself at Jesus' feet because, you keep reading, seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. So, so Jairus here uh, doesn't love Jesus. He loves his daughter. And, and this is the other gospel accounts tell us this is his only daughter. And Jairus runs up to Jesus with, with tremendous urgency. You need to understand this. Tremendous urgency. And, and if you were to kind of literally translate it into a little bit more modern vernacular, it would be, my little girl is at death's door. My little girl is dying. My little girl is about to die. Jesus, forget, forget all of, of what might um, separate us. Forget about all of what um, the other people in my social class have said and, and done and all of that. Jesus, I have a tremendous need. My little girl is dying. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And, and don't miss the spectacular nature of the first half of verse 24. And he went with him. He went with him. Jesus, Jesus knows. He he knows what the religious leaders are up to. He knows the kind of reception he gets in the synagogue. He knows what they're saying. He knows what the Pharisees are plotting. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Now, do you remember these these crowds in, in Mark? They're big numbers of people. You, you remember earlier that the, the crowd around Jesus at one point was so big that, that he was, they were going to crush him. And so he had to have a boat ready in order to jump into the boat to get away from the crowd. So these crowds, this isn't like 15 people. These crowds are, are hundreds, maybe thousands of people, certainly thousands of people at times. That, that, that just are jostling Jesus and he kind of has to press his way through all of them. And so this great crowd thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. This woman is is in a terrible, terrible predicament. She... And the language and the repetition of the language that, that, that she'd had this discharge of blood, she'd suffered much. And the more uh, physicians that she went to and the more money she had spent only left her in a worse condition than she was. And you can go look into this. You can research in some of the ancient Jewish writings about some of the um, practices that, that so-called doctors had in this, in this day. Uh, it was um, unbelievably superstitious and closer to witchcraft than it was medicine. And so this woman had spent all of her money. She had wasted all of her hope and, and, and was now just in a place of nothing else can help me. And she had heard the reports about Jesus. And you got to remember, Jesus is working his way through this crowd of people. Somewhat urgently, you would think, because of Jairus' need that his daughter is dying. And so Jesus is surrounded by a crowd, surrounded by his closer disciples. And she comes up behind him, thinking in herself, thinking in her mind, 28, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, this is equally superstitious to a lot of the um, 
<laughs> to a lot of the hybrid witchcraft of, of sort of healing she had been going after before. Um, th this is pretty similar to that. If I just touch his garment, th this is rooted in, a, in kind of an ancient thought that if you could touch even the garment of somebody powerful, that you would get a share in their power. There are stories of Alexander the Great being thronged by people just hoping to touch his garment because, well, he's great, and if you want to be great, just you won't be as great as him, but just get a piece of him. And that's sort of where this woman's thought process is. Although, unlike Alexander the Great, Jesus actually is great. And so here she comes up behind him and, and, and she touched his, his garment, just, just touched probably one of the tassels hanging off of his robe and immediately, now Mark likes that word immediately, and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now watch this. This woman came behind Jesus in a crowd of people hoping to just touch the hem of his garment in order that she would be unnoticed, that she would go unnoticed. This is a woman that had been pushed to the fringes of society. She actually would try to um, stay out of the limelight because of the, the nature of her disease and the, the, um, the, the uh, sort of... Well, the reputation that would come along with it. And, and so here she is. She's trying to remain sort of under the radar. Verse 30. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? I mean, that is, who touched my garments? Not, not who touched me. But who touched my garments? Now remember, and, and look at like, <laughs> Jairus comes, Jesus, my little girl's on death's door. We need to go quickly. Jesus goes, disciples are with him, crowd following. Somebody touches the hem of Jesus' garment. He's, he's pressing his way through a crowd of people. No doubt all kinds of people are jostling him. No doubt, you know, Peter's throwing stiff arms on people. Certainly Jairus is, is, is out front, you know, trying to get Jesus to his daughter in order to heal her of, of her sickness. And, and in the midst of all of that, Jesus is... Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say who touched me? Like, like Jesus, really? I mean, I, you know, you've been touched by a hundred people already this morning because they've all been pressing themselves around you and you in the midst of needing to get to Jairus's house, you're going to stop, turn around, and ask who just touched your clothes? I just love it. I mean, I love it. Verse 32, and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling. And fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now at this point, you need to, so, so you have what, what's, like called a sand, it's, it's kind of a sandwich actually. And, and so if, you, if you're tracking with this, you have Jairus comes. And then on the way to Jairus' house is this woman, this nameless woman. And then, and then we're going to pick back up here in verse 35, back, back with Jairus again. So there's kind of a sandwich here in the way that Mark has structured this. He didn't need to do it that way, but that's how he did it. And the reason he did it that way is because he wants us to notice a few things. And one of the things that we have to notice is we have to notice the differences between these two people. <clears throat> On the one hand, you have Jairus, who is a prominent, wealthy, religious insider. 
That, that's Jairus. And then you have, and, and you could not find a more different polar extreme than Jairus. This is a woman who is poor because she spent all of her money trying to be healed of her, of her sickness. She is obscure. Uh, she's unclean. Uh, you go read in the Old Testament and, and, and when a woman has a, an issue of blood like this, she's unclean. And so, so she, this woman would have been barred from the synagogue. She was um, single, probably, or her husband had divorced her. She probably didn't have kids. I mean, just, just you can't get further extremes than, than these two people. One, a religious insider. The other, a religious outsider. One prominent, one obscure, one rich, one poor. And yet both of them... And this is where the great similarities come together. Both of them desperately need something from Jesus. Both of them desperately need something from Jesus. Now, when you look at this woman, you need to understand that the hopelessness of her condition. You need to understand she doesn't have any more money. She can't go and try to get help any other way. She's utterly hopeless in this. And you need to see in her condition that her condition is, is not actually far from ours at all. That, that, that humanity actually, humanity finds a reflection of its condition in this woman. Something has gone wrong inside of us. There is absolutely no doctor. There, there is no superstition. There is no amount of, of effort that can fix what has gone wrong inside of us. We need to get to Jesus. He is the only one who can heal us of what's gone wrong. And, and yet, and yet some of us sit in the condition that we're in this morning and and not only is this woman's condition a reflection of our spiritual condition but but for some of us we we can really relate with this woman because we're waiting right like like we're saying man wh when am when am I going to hear you're well. When am I going to hear be healed? When am I going to hear go in peace? When, when is Jesus going to say that to me? And, and, and people have, have done, teachers, pa pastors, God help us, have, have done a terrible job with this text and other texts like it of actually heaping more hopelessness on those of us who are asking Jesus for healing. Because, because and I think, in, I think well-meaning but, but terribly destructive, they read this, your faith has made you well. Or maybe, maybe we don't even need a pastor to, to do that. Maybe we just do it. it so, so you're struggling and you're waiting and you're wanting that, that be made well. You're, you're, you're waiting for that be healed. You're, you're longing for that go in peace. And, and you read this text and you say, I just need to have more faith. I just need to have more faith. If, if I just had more faith, then I'd be healed. And I just need to tell you that that is not what the scriptures teach. And I need to point out to you that this woman's faith, it is not the quantity of the faith that she has that makes her well. She, if you think that, it's because you haven't actually read this text. 
She is coming after up behind Jesus to touch the hem of his garment, believing in some kind of superstition that's closer to witchcraft than it is an orthodox theology. You need to see that. She, she's not coming up with, with a well-worked um, out, robust theology of God's sovereignty and his love for her and how Jesus can heal her um, and will ultimately heal her on the cross. She's not coming like that. She's going, I, I, I just need help. And, and, and the little bit of desire I have is even rooted in the wrong things. And my understanding of who Jesus is is basically non-existent. I've just heard he, he's powerful and I'll just touch his garment and, and be healed. There is not, there's not some kind of well-rounded, robust biblical faith here. Yet, yet there is faith. And it is not because of the quantity of her faith, but rather the quality of the object which it is placed in, which is Christ. And Jesus sees the faith. And, and in his good timing, after 12 years of waiting, he says to this woman, be healed. And so when we read a text like this and we struggle in the way that so many of us are struggling, we do not want to begin staring at the amount of faith we have and trying to conjure up more so that we'll get what we want, which is what so many of these preachers teach. Instead, we want to look to the faithfulness of Jesus. We want to trust in his faithfulness. And when we are tempted to forget his faithfulness, and we all are, we want to continually set our gaze on the cross. Why? Because Jesus didn't see this woman touch him. That's not what the text says. The text says that Jesus felt power go out from him. And when he felt power go out from him, he could then tell that someone had touched him. And when you read that, you must, you must look to the cross. You must be reminded of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Listen to verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. You see, it is on the cross that Jesus foregoes power. It is on the cross that Jesus gives up power. It is on the cross that power goes out of Jesus so that you and I can be healed. And we have to remember that whether or not the healing the peace, the wholeness that we want in this life, whether or not it ever comes for a Christian, for a Christian, it's coming. If you have trusted in Christ, the power that he gave up on the cross has secured your healing. I have tried to teach us and remind us right in the middle of tremendous heartbreak that, that for believers who are praying for the healing, that, that for believers who are, who are praying for the healing of a loved one, that God always answers that prayer. If you, are, if you are praying for the healing of one who has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, 
God always answers that with a yes. The yes does not always come in this life. It absolutely always comes in the next. We have been healed by Jesus' um, finished work on the cross. Healing is coming. And so when I come and pray with you, I, I'm going to remind you, and I'm going to remind myself, healing is coming. We one day will. We pray in this life. We pray in this life. But if not in this one, certainly in the next, we all who are in Christ will hear, you're well, you're healed, go in peace. That is the hope for the Christian. Now, if you're not careful, you, you get caught up in the, the beauty and the wonder of, of this woman's healing and her, the peace that she now has because of Jesus. And you forget that essentially Jairus pulls up in an ambulance. And Jairus says, we got to get to my house. My daughter's dying. And he flips on the, the sirens and smashes the gas pedal. And on the way there, blowing through all of the lights and passing every, on the way there, Jesus says, Jairus, stop. Jairus, stop right here. And Jesus gets out of the ambulance and he goes over here and he talks to this woman for a while. Jesus, who is the great physician, has a really, really urgent case over here in this little girl. And, and, and here's this woman over here that's, <clears throat> that's been sick for a long time. And like there has to be in Jairus' mind as he's sitting in the driver's seat of the ambulance staring at Jesus. There has to be some like Jesus she, I know this woman, like she's been sick a long time. You, she's my daughter. Like you're over here talking to her, asking who touched you, <clears throat> looking around. My daughter is dying, Jesus. And after Jesus talks to this woman and blesses this woman, he hops back into the ambulance. And Jairus and Jesus are interrupted, verse 35, by someone coming from Jairus' house and saying, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? <clears throat> you can kind of picture this, I think. Jesus was still speaking Jairus is standing off to the side. Somebody kind of comes up and says, hey, you know, hey, Jairus, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but your daughter's dead. I don't think we need Jesus anymore. And Jesus is fully engaged in this conversation, but he's also fully engaged in this one between Jairus and this person. And Jesus hops out of that conversation and hops over into this one. And he says to Jairus, don't fear, only believe. Do not fear, Jairus, only believe. If we can do a little bit of work on that, I, th I think that's, Jairus, don't look at the circumstances. Look at me. Jairus, don't, don't, don't become fearful. Don't become fearful around your circumstances. 
because I'm here. Jairus, you weren't there, but I, I was sleeping. I, I, I was sleeping in the back of a boat once, a couple days ago. And my disciples were afraid because there was a storm outside of the boat and they were looking at the crashing waves and the howling wind and they were looking at their circumstances and they were afraid. And they were afraid because they had forgotten who was in the boat with them. Jairus, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? Now, that's a bit of a strange question. What comes next is even more strange. The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside. <laughs> There's a bit of abruptness there with Jesus. Why are you all crying? Child's not dead. She's sleeping. Now, to be clear, the child was dead. But Jesus here, with his couple of, couple of guys, his couple of disciples, this is the first time he kind of pulls them away, his couple of disciples and a grieving father and a grieving mother. She's not dead. She's sleeping. Jairus, because I'm here, and only because I am here, she's not dead. She's sleeping. <laughs> Jairus, I'm about to go wake this girl up. Now, I want you to know that from human perspective, of course, she's dead. But I know what I'm about to do. I'm about to go wake her up. So, Jairus, while all of these other people who just laughed at me while they weep and wail and all of that, and these are probably professional mourners, so, so they're, that's probably who they are. Jairus, while they all do that, you come with me because I'm about to wake this little girl up. And so Jesus walks into where the child was, verse 41, takes her by the hand. I mean, this is an incredibly tender moment. This girl is dead. She's dead specifically because Jesus didn't hurry. You understand that? She's dead specifically because Jesus pulled off to the side of the road to help this woman. And he takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha kum, which means little girl or, or even little lamb. It's, it's, it's almost like a, little, like a little pet name, like you could render it even, um, you know, hey, sweetie, hey, hey, honey, hey, hey, cutie. Little girl, little lamb, it's time to get up. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Now again, because of the fact that this nameless woman and Jairus are sandwiched together, we need to make at least at least one other observation. And the other observation that we need to make is this. 
neither of these people, meaning Jairus and this nameless woman, neither of them actually got what they had originally come for. Do you see that? Jairus comes and he says, Jesus, my daughter's sick. I need you to heal her. G Jairus is coming for healing and what he ends up with is resurrection. The woman comes and she simply wants to get rid of the issue of blood, this ailment that has been literally draining the life out of her for 12 years, 12 long years. And Jesus instead alters the trajectory of her eternity by saving her. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. Your faith has another way to say that, saved you. Go in peace, be healed. See, neither of these people actually knew what their greatest need was. They, they simply knew what their immediate need was. And Jesus loves us too much to only ever give us our immediate needs without without loving us well enough to take care of our greatest needs. So, I think the question comes for us, comes to us, in kind of this strange, how do we trust God when we're waiting. Both of these people were waiting. The woman for 12 years, Jairus for maybe 12 minutes, but would have felt what would have felt like an eternity. And, 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 and Jairus is watching Jesus kind of appear as though Jesus doesn't care at all about Jairus' situation, when in reality, Jesus cares far more about Jairus' situation than Jairus could ever know. It just didn't appear like he did, because Jesus was, was over here taking care of this other thing. How do we wait in that? How do we trust him when he calls us to wait like that? Well... Again, we need to see that on the cross, Jesus dies. Like if, if, you're, if you're just seeing a, 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 a grab by the hand and a little girl get up and a wow, look at Jesus, that's great, see ya. With, without seeing this, that on the cross, Jesus dies so that when we die, God the Father can take our hand and say to us, Arise, and guess what? We'll get up. That on the cross, Jesus dies so that he can purchase for us our own resurrections that we could never ever purchase for ourselves. And, and when, when you see that, when you are aware of that, that Jesus, I've said this to us countless times, that Jesus does not come to solve all of our problems. Jesus did not come to solve all of your problems, but he has come and taken care of your greatest one. He, he has come and taken care of your greatest one. Namely, how is it that I, a sinner, in a hopeless condition, can be reconciled to a holy God? How, how, how am I, how can I, as one created in the image of God, yet marred by sin, how, how, how can I, as an eternal being, get out of this thing alive? How... How can I, when, when, when the reaper comes for me, when death comes for me, how can I get out of that? 
I mean, that, that, that is the one sure reality. Doesn't matter if you are a prominent, wealthy, religious, um, well thought of insider or an obscure, poor, religious outsider. It doesn't matter. Death is coming for all of us. How do we get out of this thing alive? Answer. You look to Jesus Christ. You look to Jesus Christ who, who dies in our place. You, you look to the Son who was put to death at the hands of lawless men and also by the sovereign will of his good and loving Father. You look to the cross. You look to the Son. And there you see the lengths to which Jesus has gone to love us. There you see the hope for healing that will come in this life we pray, but certainly in the next. There you see that death for the Christian is not the end, rather it is the beginning. When we die, God says to us, it's time to wake up. And when we die, our sure hope is found in the fact that when Jesus died, he rose and when we die, we too will rise. How? This is the wonder of the gospel. That Jesus has won a great victory. And in winning a great victory, he shares it with us. I mean, this is the wonder of the gospel to me. I cannot get over this. You cannot either. Jesus' victory on the cross is given freely to all those who would trust in him. Some of you some of you right now are sitting under the sound of my voice. And you've been looking at Jesus for a while, and you've heard of him. Yet you think that you need to come to him with some sort of perfect, well-rounded faith. As though somehow Jesus only accepts you based on a certain quality of faith. That is not true. Jairus and this woman are clear examples of that. It's not true. It is, after all, Jesus who said the faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. A mustard seed of faith placed into Jesus Christ can move your eternity. And I pray this morning that you would lay aside any manufactured ideas about needing to have the right amount of faith, about needing to have the right ingredients of faith, Faith, the, the writer of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul tells us, faith itself is a gift of God. If you have faith this morning, place it in Christ. What he will do with that little mustard seed is he will hold it, he will keep it, he will cause it to grow, he will not let go of you. He will keep you until the end. The storms of your life will, will, will rage and the billows will roll and he will hold you through all of it. And you may not always feel like he's holding you. That doesn't change the fact that he is. And you may not always feel love for him, but you can know um, that he loves you. And in all of that, you can be assured of his faithfulness to you because of that gift of faith that he gave to you to place into him. Father, would you do that work? God, would you do that work in us? God, for those of us who have placed our faith and trust into you, would you <clears throat> increase that faith this morning? Father, might, might that faith hold in the midst of unanswered prayers and difficult circumstances? God, might that faith hold as we look to uncertain futures Father, might that faith hold as we 
grapple with the brokenness of our bodies and the limits of our wisdom and knowledge. God, might that faith hold because, <clears throat> because you have already taken care of our biggest problem. You have already defeated death in our place. God, when we die, it is though we are falling asleep only to awaken to the glories of heaven because you have grabbed our hands and have promised to not let go. Father, might you draw all of us to yourself this morning and remind us of this great love. For your glory, we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you.